in every major world religion, they have a schema for a troublesome spirit that deceives people, and when it gets in somebody's life, destroys their life. Mm. The Christians will call them demons. The Muslims will call them jinn or shaitan. The Jews will call them dibek. The Buddhists will call them animal spirits. The Native Americans, it depends on the tribe, but often they'll be seen as some type of animal spirit also. Here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. We call these special editions, The Way is Love. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com. Today on The Way is Love, we welcome back Adam Bly with his new book, The Exorcism Files. In this new volume, Adam draws from his extensive experience as a lay person assisting with exorcisms around the world. The book is a collection of his experiences presented as short stories, which highlights the seemingly innocent pitfalls and practices which allow a person to become demonically oppressed or even possessed. Adam Bly presents readers with enlightening true stories and traces their causation, whether people provided a gateway through Ouija boards, tarot cards, Reiki, yoga, or martial arts, Bly reports from first-hand observation how they were lured into the occult. Perhaps author Mike Aquinia says it best. I don't envy Adam Bly's knowledge of the world of demons. His knowledge is hard won but I am grateful to him for telling us what we need to know for the spiritual combat we call the Christian life. Casting out demons goes back to Christ, and he gave this power to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Exorcisms are done by trained Catholic priests, and Adam has assisted and witnessed many exorcisms. And joining me now on The Way is Love to share with us is Adam Bly. Adam... Thank you. Welcome and thank you for being here. Hi, David. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to begin, uh, and I wanted to give you the opportunity first to invite people who are going to be listening to our conversation uh, to consider how discussions like the one we're about to have should be approached. Well, I think the purpose of um, sharing some of what we learn from this kind of intense world of spiritual warfare with the public is to, number one, give them some catechesis and correct what society often teaches them, which is, which is usually Hollywood, basically. And Hollywood has no interest in, in proper teaching. They're just trying to sell advertising. So, number one, the purpose is to provide some catechesis about things that many people don't talk about or preach about these days. I would say number two is to take away fear and empower people, because with a proper understanding of this, it ceases to be the scary monster that's going to randomly destroy you and become something that's understood in its proper context, that these are creatures of God that are under God's control. Not that he wills evil, but through his permissive will, he allows them to operate ultimately for our good because it's by revealing some of these spiritual realities that people are inspired to seek out God. And then uh, finally, it's to give enough information to people about some of the specific practices in the world that are potentially dangerous so that they're armed and they can perhaps avoid some of the pitfalls that we see through direct experience over many years. Uh, can lead to these extraordinary demonic problems. Can you just talk a little bit how you were drawn into this work? Yeah, this is, um, I think it's a common and valid question. I'm a lay person, and it's very unusual, equally to myself, uh, that a lay person is so involved in the world of exorcism. I was drawn into this by God. I have to say that not in any, there's nothing special about me or nothing holy about me, but Um, Kind of like in the Bible, God chooses who he chooses, and it's not based on merit or anything special. In fact, he uses broken instruments so that his glory is all the more apparent. But um, I was involved in uh, research and brainwave, advanced signal processing of brainwaves and, and looking at consciousness 
uh, as part of um, graduate research in a PhD program in adult clinical psych. I have a master's in that discipline and I'm all about dissertation for the doctorate. And I had done my master's on hypnosis and specifically on changes in the brain, kind of the way the brain moves information around Mm -hmm. with shifts in consciousness. And as a side effect of that, I had seen in the lab repeatedly that with hypnosis, and by the way, Catholics were not supposed to use hypnosis. This was before I knew any of this. Mm -hmm. Um, I had seen that even in a healthy brain, no brain disease, no lesions, no mental illness, you can induce hallucinations through hypnosis if you're hypnotizable. And that was really interesting to see, you know, that, that in a perfectly normal, above average intelligence college student, Uh, with no history of mental illness or any problems at all, um, if they were hypnotizable, you could make them start hearing voices. You could put a bottle of water on the table and tell them there's three, and they would see three, and they'd swear up and down that there's three bottles of water. You could turn off their sense of smell so that you could put ammonia under their nose, and they could deeply inhale with no physiological reaction to the smelling salts at all. Mm. Um, really striking things that the brain can do in in the nervous system. And so since I knew this more from a kind of biology and psychophysiology standpoint was all very possible, um, when the paranormal craze was starting, when the paranormal TV shows were just beginning, they weren't popular yet, it wasn't normalized, it wasn't uh, an acceptable thing, you know, for people to go and do as a hobby. Um, Because I knew all this, I was curious whether these people were perhaps just deluded or their brains were producing these false experiences because the person either so much wanted that or was seeking attention or was tricking themselves. Maybe they were sincere, but these were just artifacts of the brain. So I wanted to go interview those people for myself. I had some training in, in clinical work. I had you know, been trained as a diagnostician in terms of mental illness. I had seen a number of cases. Um, so I figured I would go out and talk to these people for myself and um, was able to do that. And along the way, got called to this diocese where I now work many years later mm-hmm. uh, to kind of look more psychologically at a family that had a longstanding problem in their house that the church had been working on for for a number of years at that point. And so I was there more to look at them psychologically. Uh, but through that, I s- met specialist clergy, um, providentially met other specialist clergy, meaning exorcists and, and priests that were heavily involved in deliverance, kind of in that previous generation now. Um, and uh, met a very prominent psychiatrist who was involved in the International Association of Exorcists over in Rome, and a priest member of that association. There was no formal structure to this, but he was basically the head exorcist for the United States. He was the guy that knew everybody mm. um, and, you know, was well-established, intended to be called when there was really serious things going on. So anyway, uh, basically I got drawn into it in a time when there was relatively few exorcists in this country. Mm-hmm. I think over there in, in Italy, um, my understanding is, you know, there's been consistently a, a healthy number of exorcists. Um particularly in Rome, but I think in Italy in general, and, um, you know, numbers, who knows, around 300 or more in the country. Well, here in the United States, which is a pretty big place, as you know, uh, we maybe had 20, 25, maybe 30, um, 15 years ago when I got involved in this, and a number of them were very old, isolated. Um, They weren't allowed to really talk about what they were doing, sometimes even to their fellow priests, it was kept secret. And so it was, a, it was a rough situation where the few that were doing it were often kind of marginalized and alone. It was, it was kind of a sad solo enterprise that, um, not solo in the bad sense, they weren't, you know, lone cowboys or anything like that, but there wasn't a lot of support mm-hmm. and there wasn't a lot of community. And so over the last 15 years as I've been drawn into this, um, I seem to have a knack for teaching and I seem to have a knack for understanding what's going on in the exorcisms to the point where, you know, now I, I help train priests and um, individually they come here to sit in on sessions and we coach them because that's really the only way to learn. Mm-hmm. You can learn a little bit academically, but honestly, until you're actually in the room, you don't really get it. 
and you don't really know if you're if you want to be doing this until you're actually there. And so, um, so yeah, 15 years later now, I'm pretty heavily involved. And the purpose of these books, like the one that you just read, um, and I'm not saying this to bring it to the book to try to sell books at all. It's, in the long run, we're all going to be gone shortly, you know, yeah. in the grand span of history. Um, the purpose of these books is to leave behind uh, some of the experience that I've had in a very unusual life that might benefit other people, you know, after I'm gone or, or people that I, I won't meet, you know, while I'm here. But that's kind of the purpose is to kind of share with the community, yeah. even though some of these ideas are going to be unpopular because the modern world celebrates some of them. Um, you know, it's not a Bible thumping book of like, don't do this because the Bible says so. Yes, that's true. There's reasons the Bible says don't do certain things, good reasons. Um, and I do believe in God and, and there's some things God just tells us not to do. But the main thrust of the book is experience. So that's why instead of just wagging my finger figuratively and saying, don't do something, I'm trying to say, well, let me tell you about a situation where the person did that mm. and a real case of, of, you know, what happened. And I think we learn better from those. So that's a long winded uh, answer to your question. Yeah. You had some good advice early on for an exorc from an exorcist, did you not? Weren't you asked a series of very interesting questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, good friend of mine. Um, the first time I was handed a cell phone that, that he was on, I was driving in a car. I had never met him, didn't know who he was, didn't know his name. Um, didn't even say hello. Just said, do you have a wife? No. Do you have kids? No. Do you have any pets? No. Well, I guess you can come to the rectory sometime. Click. Wow. Uh, so exorcists, uh, I can tell you now because I have so many friends that are exorcists, um, it tends to be a fairly cagey community, um, very slow to trust, um, wary, you know, of new people. Mm. And, um, you know, we look out for each other. I, again, I'm a lay person. I don't do exorcisms. Only priests can do that with permission of their bishop. But I'm in the community. Um so we, we definitely look out for each other. We rely on each other, but we're also cagey with new people. So, yeah. you know, that, that rough introduction was not that unusual. Hmm. I once heard an exorcist describe the holiness of the people who've been oppressed or possessed. And, you know, it's, it maybe comes out of their willingness to fight. And it seems early on in the book, you, you are asking permission often uh, from the person you ask them if they want to be liberated they have the consciousness that this is happening to them and they really don't have the tools to free themselves um but uh, have you had that experience with some of the people who you describe in this book the experience of what of of uh, of seeing this experience for them or their holiness um Yes. So often people that are that are in trouble with this, I'd say it's, you know, it's really hard to put these numbers on things, but say very roughly about half of them, something was done to them. Mm -hmm. And about half of them, they did something to bring this on. Um, so, you know, things done to them was, would often be an early life in childhood, young adulthood, or as an adult, um, you know, some type of curse or uh, black magic where the person had some authority over them. So a person can't just sit on the corner and curse you, you know, while you're sitting in your living room and you're suddenly going to be demonically afflicted. It doesn't work like that because they don't have any authority over you. But there's situations where people do give authority to others. Um, and they, you know, they, they don't expect anything bad. They're not looking for trouble. So about, about half of them, um, it just befalls them because they made a mistake and opened the door and gave some authority to the wrong person. Sometimes it was done to them when they were children, um, which is very sad, just like all childhood abuse is. And then some of them get into trouble. You know, they choose to play with the darkness. Uh, they exert their will that way. And I would say that a lot of the people that get into this kind of trouble receive a lot of grace. Hmm. So it's not holiness in the kind of saccharine, 
superficial idea of holiness of like here's this pious person and they say the rosary every day and you know they're always polite and patient with other people and isn't that nice um, because often people that are in a lot of trouble they may not be able to pray at all mm. you know they, they they go to pray and their mind goes blank or or they just freeze up or, or their voice stops working whatever it might be um, they may not be able to participate in the sacraments at all you know, they have to flee when the mass starts or, or flee at the consecration, at least. Wow. Um, you know, they usually can't go to confession. If they do, they just forget why they're there and wander off. Or, you know, there's all kinds of impairments to the sacramental life. So I don't mean holiness in, in that typical sense, but holiness in a sense of um, a perseverance, hmm a deep intuitive sense that God is there, that they want to be free and they want to be with God in this life. I don't mean to pass on and go to heaven. Yeah. Um, there's a, something that drives them, that brings them to the church, um, that spurs them to come. And sometimes they'll say, you know, I don't know why I came to this priest. And, and it turns out that's like one of the only exorcist or the only exorcist in the diocese. And wow. like something just told me I needed to, to talk to this priest about this problem. Yeah. So sometimes they receive kind of a direct grace that way. Um, that's a little more clear, but boy, the, um, they really go through it in terms of the fight of coming to these prayer sessions and, and the retaliation that they often take for having come um, each week. You know, the, the week is rough in between prayer sessions yeah. um, or the time you know if it's not a week if it's a day if it's hours it's rough and so there's a perseverance through that struggle because because getting out of the grip of these things when it's gotten to the point of full possession it is not usually a um, simple and quick task it's it's really rough and there's there's usually reasons that hell has really wanted to derail this soul's ministry mm -hmm. this person is possessed and so they often will fight very hard and deploy a lot of their resources to try to keep that person from living out their vocation, whatever that might be. It's, it's incredible. And, uh, there was this whole thing about permission where I found you, you would ask the person, do you, is it okay if I pray for you about this? How important is that part of it where you have to ask and they have to give permission? Yeah. So, of course, we don't need permission to pray for people, mm. but my, my purpose in pointing that out is, is that when it comes to, to this kind of intervention, kind of where the person has come to the church and they've said, intervene for me, you know, step into this situation for me mm. and be that wedge between me and this thing and this problem, help me to be disentangled from this. A big part of that is about the exercise of the will. So it, it's not enough to, at the very beginning to simply say, well, I'm suffering, make it go away. You know, that, that's the very superficial beginning thing. And, you know, we hear that. And of course, that's natural. That's human. You know, sure. I've got a headache. I take aspirin because I want it to go away. You know, that's the magic wand. These the aspirin and, and then the headache goes away. So that's natural enough. But what I've come to understand over the years is that God is looking for conversion. He's not just looking for, um, oh, this soul is suffering, so I want them to be to be free of this. The purpose of the possession is a corrective experience so the person realizes what's going on, what they were playing with that led to this problem, or that the problem is there at all if they weren't aware of it fully. Uh, so that they can get fully out of that situation. And that conversion is deeper than just take the problem away so I can live the life God wanted me to live. The conversion is about, you know, I don't just want to be free, but I want to be free because that's pleasing to me. It's pleasing to God. It's going to allow me to do what God intended me to do, which is wonderful. And we, God and, and myself can share in the joy of living out what I was created to do. Um, there, there's a deeper mean, kind of drive behind wanting to be free than just stop the suffering. And so that's part of it. And the other part of it is when it comes to spiritual warfare, authority and permission is, is really important. 
So if the person doesn't want to be free and they don't want to be prayed for or exercised, you can still pray for them. Oh, God, please help that person. We can all do that. And there's no danger in that for anybody. But we can't go in their home against their will and hold them down on the floor and do an exorcism over them because their mom told us she doesn't like what her son's getting into when he's an adult, you know, um, or, or a spouse or something. The church, you know, God doesn't force himself on anybody. And so it's a powerful thing for somebody to exert their free will and say, yes, please pray for me. Yes, I want to be free of this. Um, and, and the third part is I emphasize that so the person has a sense of agency and a sense of empowerment in themselves that their will matters, that they can assert themselves because they're often beat down and passive having kind of gotten to the point where they're so worn down and given up on yelling and screaming and figuratively kicking and punching that they kind of feel defeated. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to reignite that human spark of assertiveness of the will in the face of something that's, that's ego dystonic to use a a psych term, Um, you know, something that, that isn't good. That's, that's a spiritual evil. And, and isn't a good experience, but and we need to assert ourselves against that, not just passively say, somebody else come and take this off me. You mentioned just how uh, people dabble in things and they really don't have a clue of what they're involving themselves with. For example, many people listening to this could think that yoga is a fairly safe kind of activity. But there are many entry points. Um, can you just talk about some of the uh, occult practices where people would, they're mainstream. There's even Catholic parishes that have, you know, quote, Catholic yoga or something. But mm-hmm. could you just talk about what the origins of those things are and how they do end up affecting people or give those people gateways to allow for something like this to happen in their lives? Yeah, so, you know, the whole yoga thing, you could easily spend an hour or two trying to unpack it all. But the core issues are, number one, um, these are worship postures that have been appropriated out of a wider spiritual system designed to worship Hindu gods. It would, so to take that simple piece of it, if you were to say like, well, you know, uh, for physical therapy, for, for the joints in your hands, we're going to we're gonna use these prayer beads, these rosary things, they call them. We're going to push them with our thumbs, and that's really good for the ligaments in our thumbs. It's good for our dexterity. But, you know, we don't really care what a rosary is about or, or what they pray with it. We just want to do the physical motion. It would be kind of like that. It would, to us as Catholics, it might be a little bit odd to see somebody doing that kind of appropriation. So at the very basic level, you're taking a worship posture for a pagan god, and you're assuming that worship posture. And you're appropriating out of a wider Hindu spiritual system that involves diet, moral teachings, behavioral uh, practices, uh, various types of prayer, um, just a, a whole bunch of things, a specifically controlled diet, etc., 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 depending on what of the thousand flavors of Hinduism you're dealing with, because there's so many kind of manifestations of it. Mm. You know, in its original form, you assume the posture of the, of the quote-unquote God that you're going to worship, and then you say that deity's name over and over in order to invite it to interact with you. Um, so you're, you're kind of calling for an interaction with that God. Secondly, when you look at, um, you know, footage of, of different Hindu, uh, basically masters, gurus, um, priests, when people are doing it in its original setting, uh, there is a spiritual initiation that comes with the laying on of hands, a, a touching usually of the forehead uh, that goes along with being initiated into these practices. So you have to be initiated through a transfer of spirit. Um, you know, of course, this this is a, a mirror of what we see with uh, baptism, mm. what we see with confirmation, the touching of the forehead, you know, and receive the Holy Spirit. Um, so, you know, there's parallels to this in many different religions around the world. But the yoga postures were part of a system that you'd be in, initiated into 
by a spiritual master within the Hindu religion. You'd receive that spirit, and yoga would be part of your practice of interacting with these pagan gods, but also of um, kind of activating and energizing the spirit that you've received at your initiation. And, and that part is what's um, called kundalini yoga with a K. Yeah. Uh, it's a long word, but it's pretty easy to figure out if you, if you Google it or YouTube it. And that more explicitly shows the, the more spiritual and esoteric goals of yoga. And you can, you know, do a search on Kundalini dangers or uh, things like that and see documentaries on this. But the idea is, and this is what they say, I'm not saying this is true. Uh, the idea is they believe that there's a spirit of a serpent that resides at the base of the spine of every human being. And this is a Kundalini spirit. And that through this initiation, it can be woken up, this touching usually. Um, by, by a, a Hindu priest or guru of some type. And then it's through the breathing exercises in these yoga postures that you then get the kundalini spirit to move up your spine slowly over hours or days or weeks or months, sometimes years people work at it, until it reaches your what they call a crown chakra at the top of your head. And the evidence that you've achieved this in their, their eyes, you know, good spiritual goal, uh, the evidence is kriyas, which are involuntary body jerks and motions and animal-like vocalizations you can't control. Mm. Um, and then a kind of a whole host of other psychological, often problems that people talk about that last for, for months or years afterwards. Um, you know, senses of the body flushing with, with heat or cold, um, disorientation, um, sleep problems, uh, too much energy and can't sleep for days, all, all kinds of all kinds of odd things. And so on the on the more esoteric and spiritual side of it, there's a very specific goal of awakening uh, an alien spirit in the sense of not normally part of your human experience, awakening that within your body. And then having it manifest outside of your control through your body. Wow. And so, you know, just if we step back, try to step back from the, well, it makes me feel good and I like the kind of Eastern trappings of it that makes it seem kind of mysterious and interesting to me. Um, and I, you know, I find it very relaxing. If we just step back from all that and just reasonably just look at that, that whole picture um, it's probably not something you would want to pursue. But of course, in the West, they don't talk about the deeper spiritual and esoteric sides of it, at least in the beginning. Usually, as you get deeper into yoga over time, you start getting initiating, initiated into chanting and breath control meditation and other things like this, and it will drift towards that more explicitly spiritual practice. You know, sure, you may never get to that point. Maybe it's always just a, a physical thing that you do at the yoga center, at the shopping center, and, and it never goes beyond that. But I would caution that even, even starting the process and only staying at the very base uh, physical level is still, I think, still potentially problematic because you may not have opened the door, but you've unlocked the door. Mm. And the other thing, and, and this is the same problem, I think, with books like Harry Potter for children is that you're not necessarily going to have a crashing problem if you, if you read that book or do just physical yoga once or twice. But what you've done is you've normalized the ideas that go along with mm -hmm. that so that as you move through life, you're perhaps more likely to dabble with them more deeply when they come up. And so you do regular yoga for a long time, and then one time you're visiting your friends in California, and, and their buddy is a guru, and he's doing this weird esoteric thing, and and uh, with advanced yoga, you know, with this more spiritual end, and because you've already been doing the physical, you think, oh, well, that's really fascinating, and he seems nice, and maybe I'll try that too. You've kind of normalized it. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of patience involved, and um, it seems like... Uh, the, these spirits will uh, 
they've just got a lot of patience that they they will wait for the right moment to enter, and when they've got a grip on you, then you you have obviously seen people uh, fully possessed or oppressed. Um, but I guess the other thing I'm wondering, as you say that, is do demons possess non-Catholics, or can of non-Catholic course. and or can can they be delivered, or have you had to have they of come? Course. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, because I don't want to. It's not just a Catholic thing. Then maybe you could just talk about that experience. Sure, um, and yeah, I, you know, I go to exorcisms every week. Mm-hmm. Um, we usually do three or four a week, um, all year round, every year, and sometimes more. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I've never sat down to calculate it, but somewhere around a thousand exorcisms, I suppose given that it's been about 15 years, and some of those years were really intense and active. Sure, we need to, I think it's important to understand that that demons, by any name, are a universal human problem. And what I mean by that is, in every major world religion, they have a schema for a troublesome spirit that deceives people, and when it gets in somebody's life, destroys their life. Mm. Um the Christians will call them demons. The Muslims will call them jinn or shaitan. The Jews will call them dibek. The Buddhists will call them animal spirits. The Native Americans, it depends on the tribe, but often they'll be seen as some type of animal spirit also. Hmm. Uh, the Hindus, it depends on which version of Hinduism you're talking about, but they, they clearly are very understanding of this. Um, and there is a version of exorcists in all those systems. Right. So there's uh, Catholic exorcists, of course, which are priests operating with a formal rite with permission from their bishop. There are deliverance ministers in Protestant churches. They can't use, by church law, they can't use, I mean, they can pick the book up and and read from it, but the demon's not going to recognize their authority uh, to do so, and it's not going to obey them. But... uh, They use their own methods of deliverance prayer of whatever type. And we can get into what's the difference between deliverance and exorcism if you want. Yeah, Uh, yeah, we can. Uh, But to to answer your question, it's not about, this is not just a Catholic problem. Um, We've had, of course, Catholics. We've had a number of Protestants. Um, We've had Satanists. We've had witches. We've had just people that aren't baptized at all and don't know really next to anything about Christianity, but they come for help. Mm. Um, Sometimes they know the association just from something as silly as the movies and and it being kind of in the, in the zeitgeist, it's kind of connected with Catholicism because of films and TV. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes they feel guided by God to go to a priest. Sometimes the Protestants, refer cases to the Catholic Church when they come across a severe case, because in a severe case, often uh, deliverance prayers just make it angry and uh, doesn't resolve it. Um, There are parts of the world where Islam and Christianity lives well side by side in certain countries and and parts of the world where they, they, in some cases, bring a lot of the possession cases to the Christians. Um, I'm not bashing Islam and saying that they, they have their own version of things. They, they have kind of two versions of exorcism. But I can tell you that amongst, in my experience, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a Catholic, but there is a little bit of a trend of different faiths when they come across a severe case of bringing it to the Catholics in whatever part of the world you're, you're looking at. And again, that could be as something as simple as if they come across a severe case, they know the association, that those are the guys that wrote a big book mm. that they go by that formalize this and, and are really, you know, into it in a sense, because um, the church, you know, focused on figuring this out and then keeping notes for a thousand, you know, a couple thousand years. Yeah. Um, so for various reasons, uh, different people come to the church and the church doesn't refuse anybody. Of course, and and we don't require somebody to become Catholic. We're not proselytizing them. We're not, wow, yeah. you know, asking them. Now, I have seen spontaneously, just through the experience of progressive liberation and then freedom, I have seen people 
drawn to Jesus in the Eucharist and wanting to become Catholic because they have such an experience of God's love and mercy through those prayers and you know in in this church but we don't we don't proselytize or require that at all yeah it's about really about liberating people from the pain and suffering that these demons inflict on them which you've seen firsthand and i just i guess you know that's another question you mentioned authority and uh, you know, for anyone listening, thinking they can just sort of take this on or that, you know, it's just a series of words or I, I guess I want to, in the terms of authority, why is it important for people listening to understand when it comes to Catholic exorcisms? It's only priests with their bishop's permission who can perform this solemn rite. I mean, you don't even do it. You're, you've witnessed sure. it. You're there. You participate, you can pray alongside, but the actual physical rite is done by a Catholic priest. So can you just talk about that authority and the authority they have, like that Christ is the ultimate authority in this? And Sure. So um, this kind of gets at the, you know, the question that Protestants have, which is, you know, can't they, through their baptismal priesthood, do exorcisms. And, and a lot of Protestants, based on certain scriptures, will argue that any Christian can do it. Uh, but, and, and I don't have my notes on this in front of me, but specifically Jesus gave the authority, the full authority to the 12 apostles. He didn't give it to the 72. When it references him giving them authority over the demons, it's in the sentence talking about the apostles. Now, the 72 do return and say, Lord, Lord, the demons are even subject to us in your name. And, um, you know, even there's that reference to, hey, there's that guy over there casting demons out in your name, but he's not with us. And Jesus says, well, leave him alone. You know, if he's using my name uh, and he's not opposing us, leave us, leave him alone. So there, there's some arguments in Scripture of like, well, any, any Christian can do this. However... It seems that the reality is two things. One, the full authority resides with the apostles. And the apostles, through direct lineage, person to person, through ordination, descend down to the bishops today. So the bishops today can person by person trace themselves back to one of the 12 apostles and therefore to Jesus. And Jesus' authority, and Jesus is the one doing the exorcism, really. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, what are humans? Like, we don't... We don't have any powers. So Jesus is doing the exorcism, and it's through that chain of authority back to the apostles and therefore to him that you can think of an analogy for that as, you know, we kind of have his ear and can, can make, make a statement authoritatively in his name because you're working for him and you have direct lineage. So that's part of it. And then the second part is it's just the law of the church. So, you know, what you bound, bind on earth is bound in heaven, what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven, that reference to Peter getting the keys to the kingdom, and the church is able to set rules that heaven will acknowledge, and not that heaven will change based on what the church says, but that the rules down here, the church has authority to kind of say, what are the spiritual rules? And the church figured out way long ago, um, by, about the fourth, by about the fifth century in the 400s or so, the church figured out that this is a ministry that's kind of uh, shouldn't just be done by any priest who wants to do it at will, and it should be well supervised, and they should decide who who's really cut out to do this. Maybe maybe somebody who's just ordained six months probably shouldn't be doing this, and um, maybe somebody who's an egomaniac probably shouldn't be doing this. And so the church figured out within a few centuries that it should be priests that are well-formed, they've had some education as priests, and they're solid, and they're mature, and the bishop basically needs to have the reins on that. And so when the law, the, the law of the church said, you can't do this unless your bishop gives you permission, well, the demons hold you to that. So one of the universal things that we see when a new priest comes for training to sit in and observe an actual session and pray along with us basically without fail, they, they get up in his face right away. And this is a possessed person, you know, a demon in a body, physically get up in his face and say, who are you? I know these guys, but who are you? And we'll challenge them and challenge their authority, even just to be in the room. Wow. 
Um, they haven't prayed, they haven't given an order to the demon, they haven't done anything yet, but they'll try to rattle them, and they'll challenge their authority to be there. And you've had that experience as well, have you not? Um, sure, in, in various ways. Um, yeah, in, in many different situations, because I'm kind of in an odd, I'm in an odd <laughs> position. Yeah. Not in a normal, I'm not in a normal position uh, with, with all them. Um, I mean, I don't do exorcisms. I, I just pray, mm -hmm. but they really don't like me. So, you know, I get a lot of trash talking. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, because it's a law of the church, um, even, even if it's the exorcist of the diocese, and we haven't yet gotten permission from the bishop because we haven't diagnosed the case and proven that there's possession because there's a whole process. The church doesn't just say, oh, you think you're possessed, so we'll do an exorcism. Uh, you have to go to a doctor and get checked out medically, psychiatrically. And beyond that, we then have to prove that you're possessed through finding certain signs of possession. So let's say we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. The demon's talking, it's taking over the body, but it's being cagey and it's not giving away any of the signs that we know would prove that it's actually a possession and not mental illness or somebody just scamming us. Um, and the priest were to say something like, well, sit back in the chair in the name of Jesus Christ, sit down. The demon will literally say, you don't have authority over me. Yeah. I don't have to listen to you and we'll proceed to not listen to him. Mm -hmm. We'll not answer his questions truthfully. Um, we'll be very obstinate and keep legally citing, you don't have authority over me. And he can step in the hall and call the bishop on the cell phone and say, hey, bishop, you know, we've got this situation. It looks real. We saw these signs. Can I have permission? And he says, yeah, sure. Comes back in the room and he can say, sit down and shut up till I tell you to talk in the name of Jesus. And it goes over and sits down and looks at him and waits. Wow. So as soon as, and, and it's not like the demon heard him have that conversation. That's out of earshot. But spiritually now, the authority's there. And they know it. And they know it. Wow. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, and, and we've seen that exact scenario play out. So authority is a big deal because demons are very legalistic. They're, they're you know, they do a lot of theatrics and scary stuff just to rattle everybody and scare them and distract them. But when it comes down to it, um, one of the valid questions is, you know, what are, what are you holding on to here? What, by what right are you still here? What is it? Is it unconfessed sin? Is there unforgiveness? Is there a cursed object here? What's going on? And when it comes down to brass tacks, they'll say, yeah, because she's not forgiving this, I'm allowed to stay. Wow. And, it, and, it, and it becomes very much a kind of a legal proposition. And as soon as a person is able to forgive or repent or, you know, the priest may pray over some cursed object or whatever it is, um, that's when the demon's cast out. So... Anyway, that's, again, a long-winded, and I'm sorry for that. No, it's Stop not. It. It's so fascinating because what you're pointing to is that it's very structured, it's very ordered, it's based on the natural law, the hierarchy that our Lord set up through uh, Genesis, through creation, through angels, through the fall, uh, that, that this is all in a very ordered situation. It's, and, when, and when there's disorder which is what I guess we would say that the, the disorder of sin, for example, or unconfessed sin, or, um, you know, the not taking seriously, frankly, the fact that these structures and laws exist, then it gives um, a sort of permission for these events to unfold. But as you explained early on, it's an opportunity for us to very clearly see how, and, and you've laid it out in the book, in a way that we can sort of clearly see there's a structure and order to this. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, we talked about it in terms of authority, but... Uh... Sure. So, you know, the overall structure of what we're dealing with is, of course, at the beginning, holy angels were created with free will, and a third of them chose not to serve God, not to obey. And they were cast out of heaven down to earth, to roam here, um, they are given permission by God through his permissive will 
the ability to roam around and tempt and accuse people. And you can see this spelled out most clearly in the book of Job in the Old Testament, where Satan has to literally go to God, the Father, and say, um, God basically says to Satan, hey, what have you been doing? And he said, I'm roaming around earth seeing who I can take out, right? And God basically says, well, did you see Job? You know, he's one of my one of my good guys. He's a really devout, devout guy down there. Did you notice him while you were going around? He says, yeah, yeah. He only likes you because he's rich and, you know, and, and happy and, you know, has all these wonderful kids and, you know, all these livestock and everything else. If he wasn't so, you know, in such a cushy position, he wouldn't, he wouldn't like you. And God says, okay, well, you can go and take away his wealth and his livestock, but don't touch him or his family. Let's see what happens. And so Satan goes and does so, but he goes right up to the line. He can't do anything more than what God gave him permission to do. And of course, we know the story, right? So Job continues to be patient and thankful to God in good times and bad. And so Satan goes back and says, you know, and God says, well, there you go. See, he's still, still being good. And this goes on and on and, of course, develops further. Um, so the, the structure what you're dealing with is these aren't random creatures that are just running amok down here on earth, tearing stuff up and destroying things at will. He allowed them to continue to operate down here. Why? Is he just mean? Does he want us to suffer? Is he just a cruel, capricious God? No. He allows them to operate so that our free will can actually be exercised. If it's only good and only God, you wouldn't even conceive of saying no. You would kind of be a robot. Mm. Adam and Eve, in a sense, would be robots in the garden until they were aware of the option of saying no. Nothing was going to happen. They were just going to live forever in the garden with God, eat food, name the animals, hang out, until the serpent came in. And I'm not saying the serpent's a good guy, but God's allowing it because certainly God was aware the serpent was entering the garden, right? It's not like anything is outside of his awareness. Sure. He's everywhere. Yeah. So God's allowing these demons to operate, not because he's mean and wants us to suffer, but number one, he wants us to exercise our free will. And without temptation, you can't really do that. So there has to be the option of being bad and saying no to God. But more importantly, I think, I think more importantly, because free will is a very important idea, um, they give us the challenges and bumps and bruises of the struggle by which we spiritually mature. Mm. So they serve in spite of themselves. It's by the very temptations and even these ugly things that we deal with in the exorcism world that human beings become wiser and spiritually mature. Think of a muscle in your body. If you literally never used it, it would atrophy and be useless. You wouldn't be able to move that part of your body. But through the adversarial struggle, the muscle gets stronger. Yeah. And the same thing with the spiritual kind of self, it's through the trials that the saint, if you read any saint's story, it's through the trials and tribulations and struggles, intense struggles, and the closer they get to God, usually the more intense the struggles become. You know, uh, the, the, in the ancient world, and this is partly why Jesus goes into the desert and why everybody understood that he should go into the desert, is that in the ancient world, the idea was you defeat the flesh, meaning you defeat your own lust and your own appetites, which is kind of like the animal self, right? Mm -hmm. So the self that just says, I want pleasure, you know, I want to have sexual activity, I want to have wealth, I want to just consume that kind of very kind of in infantile approach to life. It's just about me. I'm, I'm a narcissist and I just want pleasure. So you have to defeat that first. And then you have to defeat the world, meaning you have to defeat the temptation to just get lost in um, becoming powerful and rich and influ influence over other people and uh, all of that, which can become a an end unto itself that can become your God is I want to be as rich as possible. I want to be a millionaire. I want to have political power, whatever it is. And once you've defeated the flesh and the world, you then go to the desert. 
Why do you go to the desert? Because the desert in the ancient world was understood as the place where the demons reside. Wow. So you go to the desert to meet the devil unveiled. He's no longer veiled behind the flesh or behind the world. You've defeated those first two levels of the spiritual life. And now you confront him unveiled, which is what Jesus did with the temptations. And so um, this whole process, you know, we don't, we go through it in our own way. Certainly most of us that are, say, in our 50s now probably don't have the same, uh, the same struggles, the same issues as we did when we were in our teens or our 20s. Mm. Part of that's age. Part of that's experience. Um, but as we go along, hopefully we get wiser and, and hopefully we get morally better and spiritually better. But it's through their activity that we have these struggles and we can mature. And so ultimately, it's all for our good, even though it seems like it stinks at the moment. Like you can think back on your life to really difficult things that were terrible at the time mm. that you learned a lot from and help define who you are as a person today. Um, you know, if you, if you look at videos of the guys that go through SEAL training in the United States, they all say it was the worst possible week of their life, that last week of, of training, the most horrifically difficult, physical, not sleeping for five days, just unbelievable mm. suffering. And yet they look back on that as the, like the greatest achievement, the high point in terms of, you know, the triumph of the will over sure. the body. So uh, anyway, this is um, when we when we can see them in that sense. They're not good. It's not that we should say, "Oh, great, you know, I want to be tempted," or "Great, I want to be possessed." Not at all. You don't. It's horrible. And Jesus never came across a possessed person in the Gospels and said, "Oh, you, you're supposed to be possessed." He never did. Yeah. He freed everybody that. Anytime it's brought up in the gospel, he freed them. Yeah. So it's not something we should want. We shouldn't seek it out. I'm just saying that ultimately God can use anything for good and bring good out of anything. Um, and temptation is an important part of the spiritual journey. You've encountered and seen things that most people just never see in this lifetime and will only probably have a healthy fear of. And so... I guess what I would ask you is, I mean, why now? Is this a particular moment that the planet really needs to understand this stuff? What makes you want to share these stories now? Mm, I mean, I, I'd say maybe a third of it is just that I think after you spend 10 or 15 years doing something, if you... If you've had some success with it, you probably have a good feel for it. And so, given that this is an unusual life, I feel it's reasonable to the human community to share some of that for the, the group record. But the two-thirds of it is I think God wants these stories written down. Yeah. And I think God wants people catechized on this um, because the world at least in the West, I think is like a missionary country in reverse right now. I think the wave of Christianity and the wave of religion in general is starting to roll back. And so the demons, you know, and they were they were complaining just, just a few weeks ago to me about this and screaming about it, you know, yelling at me, why do you believe in us? What happened to you when you were young that you know that we're real? Why do you have to know that we're real? They hate the fact that I try to educate the public about them because they want to operate hidden. Mm. You know, uh, they don't want these things to be exposed. Um, but I think God wants it put out there because not many people teach on it or catechize on it. And the more your conscience is informed, you know, there, there's a burden to that. The more your conscience is informed, the more you can stay out of trouble and God, because God doesn't want you in these extraordinary problems. But the burden of your conscience being informed is you're now more accountable for your choices. So it's good, but there's a burden with it in that 
once you've been clearly and and if you feel that the person you know knows what they're talking about once you once like for instance um the parent who explains that smoking is bad to their kids and you know in detail and all the health problems and etc etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera. and then the kid picks up you know they catch them smoking they're going to have a different reaction to that than the kid who just found a cigarette and ignorantly is experimenting because he saw adults smoking. You're going to have a different reaction to the person that's been well-informed and chose to do it anyway than the person who didn't know any better and did yoga just because it's what their friend was going to. And, you know, and what I've seen is God often holds the demon back and puts the brakes on things when the people don't know what they're choosing. Hmm. Not completely, but the culpability the responsibility for the choice is less because they don't know what they're doing. And, and you can see that, like, what's the definition of sin? Sin is about intent. It's not really about the action. Yeah. Right. So if I accidentally kill somebody through no fault of my own, purely accident while driving, there's, there's a car wreck that I have no control over and that person dies, the law would say it's, it's accidental death in some form. Right? There was no intent to kill. But if I plan ahead and then kill somebody willfully, that's first-degree murder. It's mm. a very different thing. Sure. The action is the same. Somebody died, but the intent is different. Yeah. And the spiritual world is the same way. So once your conscience is informed, you're held more to account for that choice. There's a great quote that I want to read from the book. And uh, it's I, I think just to set it up for people... You you had to physically restrain people at times, and uh, you described sometimes um, there's a superhuman strength that goes on for hours and hours and hours, and um, you are holding back arms there, uh, or just uh, needing to physically restrain people. And this this was a quote that really struck me out of the book. Quote, with the help of God. I had the physical strength to keep going, even when I was the only person restraining him for hours. The temptations, on the other hand, were easy to refuse, since God is God, and that's that. Close quote. Can you... I, that was so insightful for me, just to... How matter-of-factly that stated, but how much of a raw truth that is yeah so it's important for your listeners to to understand that when we restrain people first off we we talk to the person before we pray with them you know and explain if you're struggling or if you're going to hurt yourself or you're hitting yourself or you're trying to hit us we ask is it okay if we gently restrain you only as much as is necessary to keep everybody safe and of course they say yes so we're not just grabbing people and holding them down. Sure. And, and in the United States, at least, it, it's against civil law to physically, like, tie somebody down. You can't do that. Yeah. So we, we certainly don't do that in the States either. Um, the case you're referencing, it was, it was, that was a very, very high-profile case where Satan was, and it was the actual Satan, and everybody always wants to armchair quarterback that and say, well, I don't think that's true. Tell me why. I don't know why we as humans, our, our gut reaction is always to criticize and second guess. Um, but there was very good reasons that, that indicated that it was Satan. Um, it was unlike other demons in a number of ways. Um, but the strength there was, was really off the charts. Um, and he was alternating between attacking me quite brutally, you know, in the person's body, um, trying to kill me in various ways, you know, choke me, that kind of thing, um, to grabbing me and, and whispering temptations in my ear. And it was very biblical stuff, you know, mm. all the classic temptations, but bargaining and offering various things in exchange for let this one go, let me keep this one essentially. And then when I would refuse, he would go back to trying to, to beat me to death. So um, this went on for, uh, I believe it was four days, uh, four different sessions that were multi-hour sessions. Um, and then Mary came and kicked him out. And that's when the case ended. But 
Um, so the, the temptation there, that's not normal. The other, the other demons, they don't bargain and offer things in exchange for, for letting them keep the person. Uh, but he did. Uh, I, other demons might do that sometimes with other people. In all these years, I've not seen it. Um, but he was, he was directly bargaining. You know, if you let me keep this one, I'll do this for you. What else do you want? You know, that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, and, and offering various things. But, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. Like, if you're, if you're there rolling around on the carpet with Satan, and you're in a Catholic church, and there's a bunch of priests, and um, you're doing exorcisms, and, you know, he, he hated me, it seems, probably because I train priests a lot, and maybe because I write these books and talk to the public, but he really, really hated me. Um, and so I'm having this personal confrontation with him. And then he thinks I'm going to like be like, oh, well, you know what? You're right. Maybe I'll just give all this up and give up on God because you said that. And sure. Like, what's he thinking? But he doesn't have anything else to work with. Right. right? I mean, what can he really offer? Like, once you've seen the curtain pulled back and you've seen that God's real, Jesus is real, Mary's real, the saints are real, it's all real. Why on earth would you then think, well, now I'm going to go obey this little creature over here who's, you know, yeah, he's got a lot of influence in the world, but only because God's allowing it. I'm going to go follow him? Like, it's ridiculous. And probably because people haven't heard enough about this and the spiritual tools that we do have through the Catholic Church that prepare you or can have somebody at least have a deeper understanding or at least as you said i think the key words you just said of the veil being pulled back where two things you said that were striking to me were like they want to operate in secret because once the sort of curtain is pulled back on the wizard of oz like the whole game is over and um you know i guess that's why i just so appreciate this book and that you take the time this much time to uh, speak with me and whoever is going to listen to this conversation we've done it in such the way you did the book in such a respectful way of not sensationalizing the events understanding them as painful horrible experiences for the people that have to go through with them but i mean I guess I guess I'll use a surgery analogy where you know not everyone could cut into somebody and do surgery but they know that that's going to make the person better. Some people have a skill to be able to do that. And in the work you're doing, uh, not everybody wants to step into that role. But what you get to bring back and give to us so generously is these concepts to a give us a sense of what to really be careful of and what real dangers are spiritually lurking. It's not an accident that uh, the St. Michael prayer includes the line, the demons uh, prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Like That is literally going on and has gone on. And the less we believe that, the less we believe that, the more empowered they can be. Uh, do you have any thoughts uh, just before... I mean, you, we've given me a, a lot of your time today, and I greatly appreciate that. But is there anything that we've left out or that you'd want to share at this point? Mm -hmm. I guess the only thing is, is to remember that all this information, none of it's um, particular to me. There's nothing special about um, my experience. This is all information God's provided either through experience or through the church or the saints, um, but mostly through experience, you know, learning from the old exorcists in Rome, that kind of thing. It's all God's information, and he passes this stuff down from generation to generation in a lineage. It's not new. Uh, it's just that in the West, to some extent, we're, we're kind of, our memory's getting foggy. Mm. And um, so... I'm just trying to, to, to hold up this information that we used to, used to be common sense. It used to be baked into our culture. Um, but there's nothing special about me. It's, it's all God, and he's providing the venue to do this. He's providing these interviews. He's providing, you know, these books. Um, 
and we're all just going to be gone and it's going to be other people's journey. So the most important thing I would say is that for people listening to this or reading these books is seek God from that. You know, in a sense, these are fingers pointing to the cross. These are fingers pointing to Jesus. It's not about me or the books. Ultimately, it's going to be about your journey with God. And these are designed to maybe not be the whole spiritual journey, of course, but these are for the person wandering in the world that is surrounded by a few pitfalls and troubles. And maybe you can avoid those, and maybe you can realize through the darkness that the light's actually real too. Hmm. And so the ultimate goal is to finish that journey back to God. So don't stop with an interest in these things. These things are only here because they're to be avoided, but they're not to be the center of your spiritual life yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. You'd, you'd be a very deformed, you'd have a very deformed spirituality if you made this topic the center of your spiritual life. This is just to know enough to avoid it and then focus on your journey with God. And then hopefully this is just something that's in the background that, you know, you remember a few of these facts, but the important stuff is going to be your own journey to God. The book is The Exorcism Files. I've been speaking with its author, Adam Bly, who very generously gave us his time today. Adam, thank you very much for this time. Thank you, David. It's been wonderful to talk with you, and I appreciate how attentive and thoughtful your, your questions and the interview was. Check us out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, our website, thefocusingway.com.